Hi, I'm Ted Bible, pastor at St. Mark's Methodist Church, and thank you for joining me today as we will begin a, a new sermon series uh, focusing on the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to go all the way through the 16 chapters of that book, so it's going to be a, a long and detailed and I think an, this hopefully an outstanding and blessed uh, uh, sermon series. But before we get to that, I just want to once again invite you to share any uh, prayer concerns, joys or concerns with us. We, be, we would love to uh, be in prayer with you and for you, so if you have any prayer requests, please feel free to email those to us at limastmarks at gmail.com limastmarks at gmail.com and we'd be happy to be in prayer for you. Additionally, if you're in the Lima area and you do not have a church home, we would love for you to come and be our guests uh, some Sunday morning. Our worship services begin at 1015 and uh, we would love to have you come and, and pay us a visit. Well, Christians today, uh, and that of course includes you and me, are called, in fact, we are commanded by Jesus Christ to share his message with others. Do you ever feel that you just don't have the knowledge or the skill to tell his story effectively? If so, then I hope and pray that this walk through the Gospel of Mark, literally, like I said, we're going through it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I hope that this study will give you the knowledge and give you the confidence to talk about Jesus just as the disciples talked about Jesus. So let's begin with asking the question, who is Mark? Who is the author of the Gospel of Mark? Well, Mark is also known as John Mark. He was not one of Jesus' disciples, and scholars believe, however, that he probably knew of Jesus, he knew of Jesus, he probably heard Jesus. Uh, whether he was a, a dedicated follower or not, we don't know. But Mark is mentioned eight times in the New Testament, and in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, we are told that he was with Paul on his first missionary journey. Now, each of the gospel writings, that being Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of them give us a picture of Jesus, of his mission, and of his teaching. Each is different in style, each is different in length and in, in emphasis to whom it is written. But they all have a common thread. They all have a common person, purpose. They all proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Among the four gospel accounts, Mark is unique in many ways. His is the shortest, and it is believed to be, his is believed to be written first. Both Matthew and Luke use much of Mark's content in their writings. Mark's account is written to the Christians in Rome, whereas Matthew the account was written to, the, to Jewish Christians, and Luke is written to, to Gentiles. Unlike Matthew and Luke, who begin their writings with the events surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ, Mark begins his writings with Jesus' public ministry and the mission of John the Baptist. Why does John begin, or why does Mark begin his account this way? Well, important uh, Roman officials of his day were preceded by an announcer. They were preceded by what someone referred to as a herald. When the herald arrived in the town, the people knew that someone of importance or someone of prominence would soon arrive. Because Mark's audience was primarily Roman Christians, he began his book with John the Baptist, whose mission was to announce the coming of Jesus Christ. Mark wrote his gospel to portray Jesus as a man, as a man who, was, who backed up his words with action that constantly proved that he was, in fact, the Son of God. Mark records more miracles being performed by Jesus than does any of the other gospels. Because Mark wrote this gospel for Christians in Rome, where many gods were worshipped, he wanted his readers to know that Jesus is the one and only the true Son of God. So we begin, obviously, in Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, and we read verses 1 through 3. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, 
a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. In the very first sentence of his writing, Mark leaves no doubt as to who Jesus is. He proclaims the gospel, and the word gospel means the good news that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then in verse 2, he quotes from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah when he says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, as mentioned earlier, the messenger Isaiah is referring to is John, the promised son of Zechariah and Elizabeth that we read about in the Gospel of Luke and in chapter 1. He is a cousin to Jesus, the man for whom 30 years earlier the angel Gabriel said would be filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. And here we find John fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Reading on then at verse 4. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Mark tells us that John is in the desert region, which means that he is presenting himself in sharp contrast to the Jewish religious leaders who lived in luxurious homes in the city. Those leaders who were dressed in priestly robes and who held positions of power and authority in the temple. John, we are told, is dressed in clothing made of camel's hair, which is a garment of sackcloth. Imagine wearing a garment made of burlap today. And he's wearing this to symbolize mourning. John dressed like this because he was likely mourning over the sins of the nation of Israel. John's clothing was symbolic of the clothing worn by the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Clearly, John's clothing and appearance was different than that of other religious people of the day, and his message was significantly different as well. Reading on then, verses 7 and 8. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Jewish people had not had a legitimate prophet from God for over 400 years. And now John is that prophet. But he is announcing that someone exceedingly greater than he is coming soon. He says, after me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. He said, I baptize you with water. But he, that being Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Baptism is an important sacrament in the life of the church. For many, it symbolizes the cleansing of sin. For others, it is the entry point into the membership in the community of faith. And yet for others of faith, it is the dying to sin and the rising in faith and righteousness. In the waters of baptism, we are connected to God. We are connected to our community and to all of salvation's history. In the waters of baptism, we are infused with the Holy Spirit, and thus we are led to do God's will. In the waters of baptism, we identify with Jesus, and Jesus identifies with us. Reading on then, beginning at verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Through the events described in this scripture reading, that being the opening of the heavens, 
the descent of the dove and the affirmation of Jesus and his coming ministry, we see that this is no ordinary baptism. This baptism is different. In the baptism of Jesus, we get a clear sense of who Jesus is as God acknowledges him from the heavens as my son. Now, this is a profoundly important moment as it serves as a prelude to Jesus' encounter with Satan that we read about in verses 12 and 13, where he was tested by him in the wilderness, which is then followed by the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, which we will read next week, beginning in verse 15. But this is where Jesus proclaims to the people, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So in the baptism of Jesus, we hear the words of affirmation that God said to Jesus, and we also hear the words of affirmation that God says to anyone who has been baptized. You are mine. I love you, and I am pleased with you. Mark doesn't tell us why the sinless Jesus needed to be baptized by John. But in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus states that he must be baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness, which means he must be baptized in order to accomplish his mission on earth. Some believe that this act was not only a, a modeling of submission and a, and a blessing for, for his earthly ministry and ministry, earthly mission and ministry, but it is also represented an act of him being in solidarity with sinners, sinners such as you and me. Standing in solidarity with those who often feel unworthy of God's love and grace is a powerful act that is visibly, vividly portrayed throughout the entire ministry of Jesus, as we will discover as we read through the Gospel of Mark. So today I offer you two takeaways from this introductory section of chapter 1. First, the word gospel means the good news of Jesus and the freedom he has won for us through his death and through his resurrection. That good news, which is announced in verse 1 of Mark, Mark's writing, is still God's word for us today. It is a living word that has power to change. It has power to transform. It has power to bring freedom and healing to those who accept it as the word of God. The second takeaway is this. The purpose of John the Baptist was to prepare the way for Jesus. People who do not know Jesus, which may include you, or may include some of your family or friends, those individuals whose names that we place in a jar every week here in church and that we place up on the altar, those names that we have in our prayer journals, they need to become prepared to meet Jesus. We can assist them in meeting Jesus by explaining their need for forgiveness. We can prepare them by demonstrating Jesus' teaching by our conduct and our interaction with others. We can prepare them by the witnessing of us serving those who are in need, just as Jesus will command us to do. And we can prepare people to meet Jesus by telling them how Jesus can give their lives deeper meaning and deeper purpose which will include a newfound hope, peace, joy, and love. You and I, we can make straight paths for them by correcting misconceptions that might be hindering people from approaching Jesus. But we can only do this if we truly come to know Jesus ourselves, and then if we talk openly and we talk freely with people about him. Throughout the weeks of our study of the Gospel of Mark, it is my prayer that we will move beyond just being bystanders and assuming that others will talk to people about Jesus. My friends, I encourage you to buckle up and to hold on because I'm praying that you will soon be talking with people about Jesus and that you will be praying for them as well. 
You're in for an exciting ride as we move through the Gospel, Gospel of Mark. And my friends, that ride begins today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that the Son of God came to identify with sinners such as us, so that by faith in him we might be forgiven of our sins and be clothed in his righteousness. Thank you that the Lord Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness and that through his death on the cross, he lifted the curse of death from all who would believe in his name. Thank you as well for the written word of God, which is available to us today for our study. Help us to understand and to apply all that you desire to teach us as we move forward in the weeks ahead in our study of the Gospel of Mark. In Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. Well, thank you once again for your prayer support as well as your financial support of the ministries here at St. Mark's. And if you would like to bless us with a gift, you may do so by mailing it to St. Mark's Methodist Church, 1110 North Metcalf Street, Lima, Ohio, 45801. And once again, I encourage you to, uh, if you don't have a church family, to come and join us on Sunday mornings at 1015. We would love to have you uh, be a part of our worship and our, our family uh, here in the church. Until next time, as we continue our study in Mark, I pray God's blessing uh, be upon you. Go in peace.